the alarm went off. <clears throat> and I sat up, looked over at Brooklyn, walked out the door. Our paths crossed again in the bathroom, kind of nodded. Went downstairs, ate breakfast, had the day off, so we sat down on the sofa, sat next to each other, ate lunch, just kind of looked at each other, went for a walk, enjoyed the scenery. Sat down to dinner. I said, thanks for the food. Just kind of out of habit. Watched a little bit more TV. Got a little tired, climbed the stairs. Climbed into bed. We didn't speak. The entire day. I woke up the next morning, <clears throat> nodded at her, got out of bed, got on my phone, got on Instagram, posted a picture of her, said shout out to my boo, my number one, my ride or die, the one will be near my side always. Much love. A lunch. Didn't talk. Got a phone call from a friend. I was like, how's Brooke? I'm like, things are great. I love Brooke so much. Things are awesome. Now, anybody who would look at this objectively would look at that that answer and be like, either you're lying or you're completely unaware. One of the two. Because if you go through multiple days without talking to your spouse and thinking everything's fine, maybe you've married the biggest introvert ever. <laughs> and there, there are some people who envy you because they never have the conversation end. No pointing, please. But for most relationships, for most relationships, they're going to look at that dynamic and say, something's a little off here. Something's a little off here. And yet, I'm just going to stand before you today and be completely honest. There has been more than one day of my life that I have gone through the entire day without talking to God. There has been more than one day in my life where I believe Jesus has saved my soul. I believe God is the most important thing in my life, and I believe there is nothing more important. And yet the actions of that day don't show that. Because I didn't spend a single moment talking with God. Prayer is something a lot of people struggle with, and I'm just going to be honest with you. It is not something that comes naturally to me. It's not. I have other gifts that God has given me, things that, that come very naturally to me, gifts that God, that God has given me and, and things that I have, but prayer is not one of those things. And for me, this has, been, this has been a struggle for me. This has been a lifelong struggle. It's never been easy for me. And yet, here's the thing. I'm not alone in that. And I know for many people, prayer is incredibly difficult. Prayer is one of the most important aspects of our relationship with God. But it's also one of the most foreign. Most people feel awkward about prayer. And, and, and honestly, most people simply don't. They just simply don't pray. And then when life happens, or a crisis happens, or, or something, just disaster strikes, and there's nowhere else to turn, that's when, that's when they start to pray. Even for people who love and follow Jesus, there is a subtle wonder why prayer matters, what prayer changes. 
and how to pray. That's what we're going to be talking about over the course of the next few weeks. Here's my goal. My goal is not that we would all talk about prayer and be more enlightened. That's, that's not my goal. Do I want to enlighten you with what the Bible says about prayer? Absolutely. But my goal is not that we would all talk about prayer and become more enlightened. In fact, that's never my goal when, when I stand up here and when I share with you what Scripture says. But my goal is this, and I really believe this will foundationally change who we are as people. And I really believe that this will enable us to do more than we ever could before. More than we could ever even fathom or believe that we could individually and collectively. Here is my goal. Not that we would just be enlightened, but that we would be enlightened. But not merely be enlightened. But that we would allow prayer to be something that we engage that this would be something that defines our lives. And this is something that just comes into our lives and it really becomes not a discipline so much as a privilege and something that we really look forward to. That's my hope. So if you join me in your Bible apps on your phones or your tablets, you can follow along as we're going to be looking at Luke 18 this morning. And if you don't have your phones or your tablets, you can follow along on the screens where we read these words in Jesus speaking to his disciples. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. Now, a parable is a story. So Jesus is telling his followers a story. And so he tells them a story. And the whole reason he tells them a story is this, so that they would not lose heart, that they would not lose heart. You don't have to worry about losing heart when things are easy. You don't have to worry about losing heart when things come naturally, when you enjoy things instantaneously. When you have to worry about losing heart is when things are a struggle, when things are difficult. So let's just be honest that for the vast majority of us, prayer is something that is, it's difficult. It's difficult. And we can have all kinds of ideas and wonders as to why that is. But here's just something that you need to free yourself up if you've been harboring guilt or you've been worried about this. That God understands this is difficult. He understands this is a difficult thing. And so here he is talking to his followers and he tells them a story so that they wouldn't lose heart. Prayer isn't easy. And again, that's why my hope is that this is something that we really allow to become an encounter. And Jesus continues in Luke 18, 2, when he says this, In a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. So Jesus is telling this story, and then he brings up this, this judge. So he tells of a judge who neither fears God nor respects man. So he's self-absorbed, and he's, and he's just obsessed with himself. He's self-absorbed and he's obsessed with himself. He neither fears God nor respects other people. It's all about him. And maybe some of you know somebody like that. Again, please don't point. All right? But you know somebody in your life that the story is all about them. It's always all about them. They're selfish in everything that they do. They're like, I don't care what anybody else has to say. They don't factor in anybody else's thoughts or feelings. It is them and they are all that matters. They are completely self-absorbed and obsessed with themselves. And honestly, they are miserable people to be around. They're just miserable people to be around. And what, what becomes really difficult is when they're in your family. What becomes really difficult is when you're married to one or when your kid's one and you can't kick them out of the house yet. All right? That's when it becomes really difficult. But we've all been around these people who are just self-absorbed and obsessed with themselves and say they don't care what anyone else thinks. They don't care how their actions impact anybody else. It's all about them. They're miserable people to be around. And in the story... That person's a judge. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. 
And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. Now, the widow had a case. She's longing for justice. She's pleading for justice. And so, so she goes through the proper channels. She does things the right way. She goes to the judge. And she's pleading with the judge for justice. Give me justice against my adversary. That's what she wants. The judge, he's self-absorbed. He doesn't care about God. He doesn't care about others. The widow has been wronged. She's marginalized in society. She doesn't have anybody else to defend her. She doesn't have any other advocates for her. And she is trying to do the right thing. She's followed the proper framework. And she's going before the judge who doesn't care about anybody else and saying, give me justice. This is what I want. I just want justice. And Jesus continues in this story. For a while, he refused. But afterward, he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man. And so for a while, he refuses her claim. She wants justice. He doesn't want to be bothered because he doesn't care about her. He doesn't care about others. He cares about himself. And so if he has to rule in her favor, that's going to be some paperwork that he has to sign off on. He's going to have to get involved in a dispute. He's going to have to actually hear a complaint. He's going to have to put forth some effort. But he doesn't care about effort. He just cares about himself. And so for a while, he refused. And yet there's something very telling about this judge. He's at least self-aware enough to realize who he really is. He's at least self-aware enough to realize who he really is. Because he says, though I neither fear God nor respect man. So he's come to the conclusion, I'm a pretty miserable person. At least he's self-aware enough. If you're dealing with somebody who is completely self-absorbed and obsessed with themselves... If they are at least self-aware enough to realize it, there could be some hope for you after all. It's when they don't realize it that you're just dealing with a sociopath. So at least in the story that Jesus talks about, the judge has come to terms with the fact, I'm a pretty miserable person. I get it. But he still refuses her for a while. And yet Jesus continues in verse 5. Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. The judge decides to give her justice because it's the right thing to do. Nope. Because it's the noble thing to do to look after the widows who don't have another advocate. Nope. Because he decided he really wanted to to finally fulfill his office in the role of the judiciary. Nope. Because he wants her to shut up and leave him alone. It's what he wants. Why? Because he's self-absorbed. He's obsessed with himself. And he just doesn't want to be bothered with her anymore. That's why there's the old saying, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. She just keeps coming back and he's just fed up. He doesn't want to deal with her anymore. He's basically saying, so that she will shut up and go away, I will find in her favor just so that she will leave me alone. I just want to be left alone. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says. Now, we look at this and what do we see? We see some incredible takeaways. First, there is value in persistence. There is value in persistence. We see this all over life that you are going to fail and you are going to fall down. And there are going to be times where where you don't succeed. And so there is value in persistence. The first time I ever asked Brooklyn out for a date, she told me no. True story. I know it's hard to believe, but she, she took all this in and said no. 
And so I looked at her and said, fine, I'll go take the walk of shame and made her feel bad, right? <laughs> Step one. Six weeks later, her coworker comes up to me and says, you should ask Brooke out again. And I said, you have a really sick sense of humor. And she said, she said, no, really, you should ask her out again. And so we worked at the same place uh, across from each other in, in a place where there were a number of shops. And the first time I asked her out, I just walked up to her and asked her out. I don't care. What, you know, who cares? She said no. Who, listen, for those of you right now who are dating, all right, this is Uncle Brian's going to talk to you for a minute. Get out your phone. This is all going to be noteworthy. For those of you who are dating right now, you are going to freak yourself out because you have just built this person up in your mind. And they, oh, oh, Brian, the way that she looks at me, time stands still. My heart skips a beat. She is the most gorgeous woman I have ever seen. And I will be, oh, I will just be so lucky if she'll go out with me. Or ladies, you're like, Brian, you don't understand. This guy is fine. He is, he is fine. He is a whole new level of something when I look at him. He is just like, mm. He, yeah. He better ask me out. Because if he doesn't ask me out, I'm going to ask him out. Because I'm telling you, we got to. But you're going to build this person up in your mind. And then sometimes... Sometimes they're not going to slide into your DMs. And then you're going to be like, oh, my life is over. My life is over. They didn't, re they, didn't, they didn't feel the same way when I hit them up on Bumble. And so, oh, I can't believe he doesn't want to go out with me. And, and for those of you who are like 40 and over, you're like, what's Bumble? Don't worry about it. We'll get back to you. <laughs> all right, unless you're single, then it's all the rage these days, all right? But hey, you do you. You're going to be like, oh, he didn't hit me up on mom. And, and you're going to, you, will, you, will, you will wreck yourself in your mind because you'll constantly be worried about this. Little tip from Uncle Brian. Ask him out a second time. Ask him out a second time. Now, listen, there's a fine line bet between persistence and stalking, all right? And so, you know, I would say two's the limit. If you're feeling real dangerous, maybe three. But beyond that, there's going to be a police report. So don't go beyond that, all right? And at some point, it's just going to be tragic, and we're all going to feel sorry for you. But you, you might get, don't worry about it, all right? Be persistent. Be persistent. Some of you are going to apply for a job that you really want, and you're not going to get that job. And then the question is going to be, well, how do you respond? And what do you do? And do you just quit trying? Do you just quit trying? Do you just say, ah, maybe I'm not cut out for this? No. No, continue to hone your craft, continue to refine your skills, talk to people in the industry, and when there's another opening or an opening at another company, you apply for it and you go for it. Nobody in life is ever going to have everything go their way just the first time and everything that they want to go after succeed, all right? You're going to have to be persistent. And what we see in this story is even with a horrible person, who is self-absorbed and obsessed with himself, even there, there is value of persistence. And I have another question. Is this how we view our prayer life? Is this how we view our prayer life? And I would say I sure hope not. I sure hope not. You're like, what do you mean? Well, yes, I hope that we're persistent in prayer. And yes, sometimes when we ask God for something and it doesn't happen right away, it doesn't mean that God isn't going to give us those things. It just means that the timing isn't yet right. But we need to understand something. That the God that we pray to isn't some self-absorbed and self-obsessed being. Isn't somebody who is bothered by the fact that we would come to him with a request day after day after day. Jesus keeps going and he says this in verse 7. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them. Does God want to hear our prayers and our requests? Yes. 
He does. Is there value in us being persistent and going before God constantly? Yes, there is value in that. But understand the dynamic. It's not that we are approaching a self-absorbed and self-obsessed, detached God who is bothered by us coming to Him. Instead, we contrast that, and nothing could be further from the fact of the God that we engage when we pray. And that is a God who is interested in the minute details of every single one of us, not as a distant judge, but as a loving father whose children come before him. Do you see that difference? And I get it. For some of you, you grew up in really hard times, and it's so hard for you because you don't have any picture other than a detached, self-absorbed dad. And so this whole idea is really difficult for you to wrap your mind around just because you go back to the horror that you know as you grew up and you so badly wanted the affection and the attention of your father, and yet he was distant and he was gone and he was nowhere to be had. And until you really deal with that and peel back the layers and understand how that has impacted multiple aspects of your life, I I, I would just say you're never going to really be able to fully latch on and understand this. And that is a painful process that I promise you is going to hurt. But I promise you will be so worth it. If instead of just covering it up and trying to power through, you really go back and start to peel back the layers. Not just because it has the power to help you view yourself and how you view yourself, but also because it has the power to help you see yourself and see your relationship with your Creator and how God sees you. He's not a distant God who's too busy for you. He's not a God who's annoyed by you. He's not somebody who just doesn't really want to be interacting with the minute details of your life. He's a father who desperately wants to give in to his kids. And have we understood that? Have we allowed that dynamic to just permeate how we talk to God. I tell you, He will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will He find faith on earth? See, Jesus tells him this story. And he tells them this story to tell them, don't lose heart. That even with somebody who's self-absorbed and obsessed, even with persistence there, when something certainly wasn't easy for the widow, and yet day after day, she went before the evil judge, never giving up, never throwing in the towel, and day after day, going back to the judge and saying, give me justice, give me justice, give me justice. And finally, the judge relents and gives her justice. Even there, We see the value of persistence. And Jesus tells the story, but you don't have to worry about that. How much more so is a father who's loving going to see that persistence? How much different is that dynamic going to be? See, Jesus gives us this story because he says, even in the worst case scenario, this persistence pays off, but you don't have to worry about that. You have the best case scenario. So how much more persistent should you be? Not because you serve a detached God, but rather because you serve a God who wants to be engaged in your life. God wants to intervene in your story. And he wants to do so quickly. And yet, I'm just going to throw out a disclaimer here that I think is very important for all of us to understand. That just because we pray about something and pray about it repeatedly does not mean that God is going to answer that prayer the way we want him to. And it doesn't mean that God is any less loving 
because he doesn't choose to answer our prayers in the way that we want him to. If you've ever prayed for something and not gotten the answer you wanted to, you know that it hurts. And you know you question, God, why is this? God, why would you do this? God, why? Why wouldn't you answer this prayer? And I've just got to tell you, with 20 years of hindsight and Facebook, I am so glad that God didn't answer some of my prayers when I was a freshman and a sophomore in high school. I said it. And don't worry, I'm sure those ladies are glad God didn't answer their prayers too. All right? So I get it. I get totally get it. But you look back with the value of hindsight, and sometimes you're like, God, thank you so much. God, thank you. And I know right now some of you are singing a Garth Brooks song in your heart. That's fine. All right? But... But here's the deal. Sometimes we look back, and those, those are great ones, but sometimes we look back and I'm like, I don't know. Why? Why would you allow that to happen? Why wouldn't you intervene in the way I wanted you to? That's when it gets hard. I remember a few months ago, we were outside doing something, and one of my kids got a splinter, and so their thumbs started to hurt, and so we sterilized the needle, and then you start digging, and we used a little more precision than that, fear not, but you, start, you just start digging, so you got to get it out. It's going to continue to hurt. It could get infected. You've got to get the splinter out. And the entire time, they're begging us, to stop. Don't dig it out. But I've got the perspective that they don't have. And I'm not going to sit my kid down and say, okay, now if we don't get this out, your thumb's going to get infected. And then you could get an infection that can travel through your body. And then you're going to have to go to the hospital and get treated. And while you're there, you might get staph. And while you're there, that could attack all of your organs and they could shut down and you could die. I'm not going to go through all that with my kid and traumatize them even more so than a needle entering their flesh to dig out the splinter. A small sick part of me thinks it might have been a little fun. But fear not. Fear not. God... God's working on me and he's given me Brooklyn, all right? So don't worry about it. We didn't go that route. But I have more perspective than they have. It doesn't mean that the needle hurt any less when it went in to dig out the splinter. And we didn't take it away until the splinter was gone. Because in the long run, it was for their good. And there are times where God will be working and we will not understand it. And it will not feel good and we'll want it to end and we'll want God to do something else. And these are the moments that faith has to take over. But if we're not careful, what happens is we start to lose our persistence. We start to allow anger or resent to grow. And rather than confess that to God who already knows about it anyways and just deal with it, we say nothing. Are we persistent with a Father who loves us and wants what's best for us? And I don't, think it's any, I don't think it's any coincidence that Jesus ends the parable with the question that he asked. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Will he find faith? We look and we live in dark times. 
And this is why this is why our mission here at Lakeside is this that we exist to help people move one step closer to Jesus and reach those who are far from him because we live in a dark world we live in some dark times but understand this that prayer is one of the greatest indicators of our faith prayer is one of the greatest indicators of our faith and one of the greatest catalysts for our faith Prayer is one of the greatest indicators of our faith and one of the greatest catalysts for our faith. And I get that it feels awkward. So does the conversation on a first date. Doesn't mean you stop. So I want to challenge each and every one of us to do something. And that's for each and every one of us starting today through the next five weeks. For every day for us to have at least three requests before God. One is personal. One could be something you don't talk about with anybody else. It's just you. Just you and your dad. It can be something that nobody else knows. It's just, it's personal and it's you. Second is is something that has to do with your family or community. Family, friends, people you live around. Something along those lines. And then the third would be something professional or something circumstantial. Something about your profession or something about your circumstance. But the challenge is this, that we would say for the next five weeks, and we, we know what these things are. The the challenges that we're facing, whatever the case may be, all of us have different ones, but, but we know exactly what we're facing, whether we like to acknowledge it or talk about it or anything else. We know what these things are. And so for the next five weeks that we would just say, I will commit at least once a day to go before my good dad who wants to hear from me and who loves me and cry out something I'm dealing with personally something either my, my family or community is dealing with, and something professionally or circumstantially that's going on. And as God answers those prayers, and He will, I'm going to ask you to share those with us as a community. And if something's incredibly personal, you can either send it in anonymously or you can just leave that one off the list. We understand. And we're not going to air any of these in a forum that you're not comfortable with. But collectively, let's see how God is working and engaging in our lives and our lives together. Not only that, we've recently opened up an email address that is prayer at lakeside-church.com. Prayer at lakeside-church.com that is just devoted, that is just devoted to receiving requests that people have so that we can join you in praying. Every week, every week when people either email a prayer request to the office or when they write one on the information card right here, it says, I need a prayer. And utilize these because every single week, we as a staff here at Lakeside, we sit down and we pray over every request we get. Every single one. We want to pray with you. We want to pray for you. And I really believe that together, individually and collectively, if we will make this a part of our lives, God will do incredible things in us, through us, in spite of us, both individually and collectively. But it starts with us being willing to go before our good Father. He wants to hear from you. So right now, I'm just going to walk off this stage quietly. And as the band comes up, I want to encourage you to use that time to start praying your three. If it's something that we can pray with you or for you about, put it on the card. Or email it to us at prayer at lakeside-church. And make today the first day of the next five weeks where we make a commitment and we see 
how God goes to work.